Hello, it's Scott Badley here. It's time for another batch of supporter questions. Questions from people who uh, basically give their hard-earned cash to actually support this strange hobby where I learn stuff about science and teach you all. So yeah, we're gonna go get right down to things. I get the app open here and we have Andrew J. Walker asking, I was wondering how you feel regarding the viability of laser launch systems using ground stations to push payloads through the thickest parts of the atmosphere. I know there's ongoing research at very small scales, but how well would such systems scale up and would the necessary elimination of the first stage have a major impact on launch profiles? So look, um, the idea with laser launch is that you have a powerful laser that you know basically powers an engine of some sort. And there's actually bunch of different ways. One example I saw is you basically fire the laser into a parabolic reflector and that reflects the thing to a point which heats the atmosphere. So it's like an air breathing rocket but the energy is coming from the ground. Now I think that's very good at to, through the thickest part of the atmosphere as you said but it obviously loses propulsion later on. The, the, the idea is you're basically offloading the energy requirements from the rocket itself to the ground. The downside of this, of course, is that you still need propellant, so you can't use it at higher and higher altitudes. H however, you know, you could have, say, a microwave powered system. There's an idea for that where you basically heat up some sort of, uh, you know, element which is designed to absorb microwaves and you can then blow hydrogen over it and get something like a nuclear thermal thruster with the nuclear stuff or whatever being all on the ground. These are all very interesting ideas. The, the problem right now I'm seeing is that actually, you know, reusable first stages are becoming the easy part, right? We've demonstrated that we can very easily take a first stage booster, launch it, send the payload into its first step and then have it fly back. That's, an, that's almost a solved problem. And so really you're looking for things that can help with the second stage. I think there are definitely, uh, there's definitely, it's also more interesting, I think, in environments like Mars, where you don't really have a readily available source of chemical fuel. You can use the carbon dioxide atmosphere, but you know, carbon monoxide, carbon oxygen thrusters aren't that efficient. So if you could have the energy requirements offloaded to the ground, it could be useful. So I don't see this going anywhere for major launch and scaling it up anytime soon, but there are niches where it could certainly make sense. Uh, you know, uh, Venus maybe? I don't know. Anyway, oh, Titan. Yeah, Titan, that would be a place where you could definitely think about a, a laser-based power system or something like that. Obviously, we'd have to get through the clouds. Okay, anyway. Daryl Nelson, does a volcanic eruption produce enough energy to launch a rocket? It easily produces enough energy, but that energy is not concentrated into a small enough area. You know, volcanoes produce humongous amounts of energy, like way bigger than some nuclear devices sometimes. The problem is that you're blowing cubic kilometers worth of rock into the air rather than a very small, I mean, the Saturn V is relatively small when you compare it to, you know, cubic kilometers worth of rock. So yes, the energy is there. It just doesn't move, work in any mechanism by which you could actually accelerate a rocket to launch velocity. There is a, a concept called the thunder well, where you have essentially a uh, a big borehole with water at the bottom and then you jet, you put a rocket on top of it with a pusher plate and you jet detonate a nuclear weapon. In theory, you could probably use steam pressure from geothermal stuff somehow and that could get you a little bit of a boost, but you'd still be facing the fact that it's a linear accelerator in a finite barrel and you're not going to be, uh, you're, you're not going to be launching people that way. Yeah, volcanic eruptions generally will not be launching anything into space. I, I guess the one case where you might have is you, if you have two big, powerful, you know, shock level eruptions and the shock waves collide, then you've got a collision path, path there where you've got two, you know, high pressure waves coming together and you can get materials squirted out that way at very high velocities, possibly higher than escape velocity. But I think more likely the a natural mechanism for launching stuff into space is an asteroid impact, which again, you have impact that comes down and the this sort of shock interaction squeezes stuff out at very, very high speeds. Wow, I'm getting, I'm really slow today. Elian S says, hi Scott, I'm a huge fan. Considering the benefits of space telescopes, will ground-based telescopes become obsolete given declining launch prices? 
When will it make sense to have one on Earth versus one in space? I think that both these things will continue to exist. For all the... Um, for all the complaints of satellites and stuff getting in the way of telescopes, algorithms that remove satellites are doing a pretty good job of keeping up and, and making that thing a non-problem. It was obviously a much bigger deal in the old days when you had photographic plates that you had to develop, but now you can have uh, imaging CCDs or imaging systems that can electronically process stuff um, you know, we're not, we're not going to see that disappear anytime soon. So anyway, does it matter that you can launch... Well, you know, do, is there a point at which having space telescopes really does start to make sense? Um, I mean, look, I, I could imagine that when you get up to very, very large mirrors, if you can figure out... If you can figure out how to mass produce these things, that's really the point at which having them in space makes more sense. But... When you look at telescopes, you've got to realize it's not just the giant mirror, right? It's not just the a dome and the pointing hardware. There's the sensors and the experiments on the back. and It's quite often that these experiments get changed out. So you have to factor that into the usefulness of ground-based telescopes, that you can change um, change the, the, the imaging hardware as technologies improve. So I, I think, sure... There may be some scale at which building very large telescopes in ease in space becomes much easier than building them on Earth, especially if you can have these things sort of self-align and self-assemble. Uh, but I don't think we're ever going to see ground-based telescopes go away completely because it's very easy for people to come up with an idea and build it, prototype it, and make it happen. Like, I remember... I know somebody, they built a telescope to go looking for gamma ray burster events. And what it was, was they bought some commercial small, you know, telescopes and they put it on a very rapidly tracking mount and they hooked it into a system that would get the alerts off the internet and within seconds it would be pointing at the object and getting imaging. That was something that was built in a very, very small amount of time. Uh, I'm not sure we'll ever get to that level of, you know, working from a shed with a space hardware. Matonius is asking, can I bake a turkey by throwing it down from Earth to Earth from orbit, or will it burn slash disintegrate upon entry? Uh, could the turkey with some kind of slowing down propulsion make it? So, uh, first of all, yes, if you drop a turkey down, it will just basically disintegrate uh, unless it is shielded in some way. Obviously, you could shield it with aluminium foil or tin foil, as some people call it. I mean, it's aluminium these days. Uh, yeah, foil-coated turkey, lots of foil. I don't know how much foil you'd need. The problem with baking a turkey is that you need... To, it takes a long time for the heat to propagate down into the middle to make sure it's properly cooked. So you'd actually want to put it in an orbit where it's sort of spiralling around for a few hours in the upper atmosphere, getting heated, but not falling down so quickly that it's uh, reaching that critical burn-up phase. So you have to accurately design your foil housing, foil coating for this turkey to ensure the ballistic coefficient is correct to support fully baking the turkey. Then it has to be sufficiently strong to actually not burn up completely and make sure the turkey arrives on the ground. I'm sure it is possible. You might have to have an ejectable heat shield though at some point. You might have to do something like you, you have the turkey in an actively stabilized mode where it's doing its initial pass through the upper atmosphere, uh, where it's pointing backwards and the foil is absorbing the heat and passing that through. And once it gets to the more intense heating, it flips around to like an ablative heat shield so that it can survive the really high heating and still using the, um, you know, the radi radiation emission to heat the back end of it. I'm sure this is a problem that could be solved by engineers who were sufficiently interested. The energy is there, right? The kinetic energy in a turkey at orbital velocity is more than enough to cook a turkey perfectly. The question is, is how do you get that into the turkey to create the most perfect succulent meat? And how do you land it just in time for Thanksgiving and or Christmas, depending upon which country you're in? Eric Marcel. Would it be feasible and or beneficial for the Neutron rocket to take advantage of its design by having a first stage do a suborbital hop to a better launch site? I mean, they're apparently planning to build a launch it from the Mars spaceport, which is 38 degrees latitude. So what if they just chartered an Antonov or Beluga obviously recorded 
<laughs> Obviously, this question predates the current situation in Ukraine. Uh, to fly a couple of second stages to Alcantara Spaceport, which is at two degrees. Hope, hop the first stage over and just stacked it there. Uh, frankly, if you're if you've got a rocket and you want to launch it from there, why not just send it down on a ship, right? I think that would make far more sense. Yes, I'm pretty sure that I, I don't actually know for sure I, how. Uh, I don't know the mass ratio for the first stage of a uh, a neutron rocket. I think it might be possible to travel, you know, was it 38 degrees latitude down to two degrees? So that would be 36, uh, 36 degrees times 60. I can't do this number in my head. It's thousands of nautical miles, right? <laughs> it's about 2000 nautical miles, which means quite a, quite a lift. It, would it really is gonna depend on the mass ratio of the first stage. I don't think it actually could get that far. But maybe Peter Beck has a different idea. Or maybe I'll go and do the math when I find more information and find out. I, I don't think it could do, do, do that hop. But I think it would make far more sense for them to travel, you know, take it down. But the other thing is, Neutron is pitched as a uh, launch vehicle for mega constellations. And mega constellations actually go into higher inclination orbits because they want to cover the Earth. So actually going to an equatorial launch site doesn't help you there because you really want to be, I mean, sure, I guess you get a little bit of an advantage, but it doesn't really help you that much because you're still going into a higher inclination orbit. Uh, now, if you were launching geostationary satellites, then it would make sense, but uh, Neutron is not really set up for that. Okay, um, Isabel Erickson, could we harness magnetic slash radiation energy power spacecraft? Yeah, I'm thinking about Europa Clipper, which orbits Jupiter and is exposed to high magnetic and radiation fields. The Clipper will be powered by solar panels, which will degrade over time from the radiation. Can magnetic fields be used to power future orbiters? This is something that has actually been looked into. So yeah, there was a space shuttle experiment with the electrodynamic tether. That's basically where they reeled out a very long cable and, you know, they looked at the electrical power flowing down this. It totally works in theory. When you've got a long cable and it's moving through magnetic fields, it will induce currents. Now, they ended up losing the tether in space. Uh, it, it's, I think it had a, it over, I don't know, something happened and it broke. <laughs> but people have very carefully studied whether you could use tethers of this type for missions to Jupiter. And they're not just interested in taking the power in they are interested in putting power back into it and actually pushing the spacecraft around. So obviously that makes more sense if you have a power source like solar panels. Now, it's easy, like if you have kilometer long tethers to get the kind of powers you need if you're orbiting close to Jupiter. The problem is that you have quite a range in the amount of power output depending upon where you are in the orbit. So if you think about it, the as you're slowing down, right, you're generating a force on the cable. So if you're gen, the, an energy output is equal to the force times the distance. So if you're traveling at 30 kilometers per second, say near Jupiter, then every one Newton is producing 30 kilowatts of power. And so you need your tether to be small enough that that energy is, uh, is within the levels that you can cope with, but also long enough so that when you're further out, you're still getting enough energy to stay alive. I, I believe one calculation, they basically looked at the idea of having a spacecraft basically use an electrodynamic parachute or braking system for entry into Jovian orbit. And they figured out that the spacecraft would need to handle about seven megawatts of power. And that is very hard for a very small spacecraft when they're talking about like a, a few hundred kilogram spacecraft. Maybe there's an idea there for a spacecraft that has a like a radar dish and it can work as an electrodynamic power thing and then use that power to zap stuff. So look, it is there, it is possible. The other thing to worry about with electrodynamic tethers is the forces acting on the tether will cause it to you know, bend and flex and keeping it stable is hard. Jupiter's magnetic field is much stronger than Earth's, but because you're much further out, the tidal forces actually tend to be weaker, so you can't rely on gravity gradient stabilization for your tethers as much as you can in Earth orbit. So I think the studies I remember, 
they had like a dual lobe spacecraft with a pod at one end and a pod at the other and a big cable in between swinging around. So yeah, there is active research, it is possible, but the engineering trades don't make sense right now. In, in basically, you want to have tr your traditional rocket thrusters and power systems make far more sense and are far more stable when you're sending a mission that is possibly costing hundreds of millions and or a billion dollars. Basically, no one's taking that risk. With Webb, who oh, Samuel Voss is asking, with Webb's tennis court size sun shield, will it be reflective enough to see from Earth? So, uh, let me think about this. Um, okay, so, so uh, it's about a thousand, it's 1.5 million. Okay, so it's about 3,000 times the distance of, no, it's, yes, yeah, about a thousand, a thousand times further from the observer than a satellite in orbit, right? And one of the basic relationships in astronomy is every factor of 100 in brightness is five magnitudes. So a factor of a thousand is a fact uh, in distance is a factor of a million in the you know, inverse square law. Therefore, that's 15 magnitudes fainter than objects in low Earth orbit, which you know could be anywhere from your know, naked eye to very bright. I think. Just off the top of my head, that we're talking about uh, magnitudes of maybe 15 to 18, and that is totally within the brightness capabilities of amateur equipment. If you know where to look and you you take a, use a camera and you get the thing dialed in and lined up, I think amateur telescopes should totally be able to see the JWST, and they might even there might even be moments where it's lined up perfectly and it creates like a, a flare since the mirror, uh, the, since the shield is like a mirror, there may be, I don't know, has anyone figured out like observation plans, whether you there will be cases where the mirror perfectly reflects the sun back to earth? God, I hope, I hope there's tools that figure that out because it'd be really cool to be able to see that uh, through e just through a telescope. Uh, okay. Uh, pictures of the International Space Station always seem to show the solar panels pointing in various directions. If this is it, is this so they don't generate more power than they need, or is there some other reason? Uh, solar panel attitudes are yes. First of all, they they do this to control the amount of power. Sometimes they don't want to have you know all the power coming through this because they otherwise have to dump it via some other mechanism. But also, they adjust the solar panels to control the drag and the torque on the space station. So as it's moving through the tenuous upper atmosphere, the solar panels are acting like sails. And it's not so much that it slows the space station down that they're worried about, as that it causes the space station to twist in one direction or another. And if you have an ongoing twist in a particular direction, then your reaction wheels get saturated and you need to use reaction control thrusters to take that out. So there are uh, guidance protocols in place to make sure that they can use they can adjust the space station to try to minimize the you know the desaturation burns that are needed and i don't know the exact details of it but i'm pretty sure that is one of the reasons why this happens uh, eric hedman is there any future in any electric pump fed engines from now on epfe or are they a dead end from what i get I understand turbo pumps are less efficient at small engines more or less, it's harder to make a turbo pump at a small scale work. And together, the greater simple simplicity of EPFE makes sense in small engines, but not in larger. But if batteries get more energy dense, I guess larger engines could be made too. Okay, so look. Um, you, you basically, that's, that's always been the story I've been told, that when you're scaling down turbo pumps, it just gets harder to make them work at smaller and smaller sizes. And there is this point where battery technology is the easier option. And in many ways, it's, it is actually easier from an engineering point of view, because you're not having to deal with the extra plumbing. Uh, it's much easier to plumb electricity around and much easier to buy batteries off the shelf. So that's obviously been very appealing for both Rocket Lab and Astra, but you know, Astra is going to a, a turbine-based system and so is Rocket Lab. And of course, um, the one advantage though that I do see for electric pump engines, one niche, which will probably not go away, is the way that we have the the large photon spacecraft, the, the spacecraft bus that Rocket Lab is using for the capstone mission. It has this thruster 
and they can use the electric pump for burns in low earth orbit and then when the batteries get depleted they charge it up using the solar power and then they make another burn later so they can maximize the efficiency they can get higher pressures inside their combustion chamber than they could get by a traditional pressure fed system without the extra complexity of uh you know, of a tur or, you know pump-based system, but also, I mean, they're basically taking some of the energy that is going into their propellant from the sun. So I'm wondering actually where the mass uh, trade-off comes there, if it actually is an advantage compared to, say, a small turbine-fed engine. That one's curious to me, but the idea that this thing is in space for a very long time and can recharge those batteries off of solar, that has a real genuine advantage, right? And there's probably a niche for that that will continue to exist. So I'm at 20 minutes. Uh, I actually have to go to work right now, but thanks for asking the questions. Check on over at Patreon. I promise I'm gonna start posting more stuff there. I know uh, I had a really cool post written last night and then the app crashed. So I'm like, ah, never use the app again. Website all the way. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.